Ushers are going to go ahead and start passing out these little flyers. We have been talking about India. In all the last series, I had everybody ha taking their phones out. You can take it out right now, take a picture, do something with it, and then hashtag it with at the movies, TRA 2015. And every time somebody hash used that hashtag, we were donating out of our general fund toward India. Well, I want to take this Sunday to talk about what's going to be happening in India, why we are going, what all is happening with it, and then I'm going to give each and every person in the room the opportunity to partner together with us as we go to make an impact in India. So I want to just go ahead and start with this short video that gives a description of the area that we're going into in India this year. So let's take a look at the screen. Over 500 believers were brutally murdered. Over 4,000 homes of Christians were destroyed. Hundreds of churches torn down. Over 50,000 innocent believers, they had to flee into the jungles, into the forest for their life. Jai Bajrambal ki jai, Jai Hanuman, Jai Bharat Matakuli, Shilogan Dibbe. He comes back, uh, the anti Christian people are waiting to kill him. Even they have killed one of the believers of this church. Yeah, till now we are not able to go inside the village and, uh, and we hope that God will open the way for us to enter into the village. And also we are praying for the persecutors that Lord will work in their heart. He will change the heart and minds of those people and they will allow us to enter into the village. Or 14,000 believers are brutally murdered every year for their faith. Who are these people? These are our brothers and sisters born by the same blood that made us to become the members of the family of God. And may you I live such a way that we may be willing to embrace difficulties, inconveniences, suffering in whatever it takes to express our love and compassion for the suffering body of Christ. All right, so. That's a pretty gripping story of what's been happening in India and, and the different persecution and, and the tremendous trials that are happening there. And so we have here with us today Hema and Saima, and they are from India in this region where we've, they have experienced this tremendous amount of persecution. And so uh, today, this morning, I want Hema and Saima to go ahead and share with us a little bit about the history of what's happened during that period of time, and then what's happened since then, and then the opportunity that we are facing today with what God's going to do through us. 
Hello, good morning, and good to be with you all today, this morning. And uh, uh, as you we saw, uh, persecution is, uh, was going on, it started in 2008, and a uh, lot of damages has happened, something, uh, many things that never been recorded. Many children, and uh, when, when the villagers, the Christian villagers ran for their lives, you know, 400, 500 mobs with all the torches and uh, s all kinds of arsenals. They wanted to completely obliterate Christianity from this uh, land, from this mountain area. And so people ran to jungle. Many children were delivered and they were dead. Many people were snake beaten. Many died of hunger. Uh, many died of lack of medicines. Many older people ha having arthritis and all kinds of difficulties. They couldn't even walk, so they just died on the process, on the spot. People, uh, many people were killed. So that is the grim story. It's a real story, uh, and uh, uh, we had the honor and privilege of uh, going through some of those places. And so now, in 2008, all these things happened, and the government of India took a drastic step. All those people are facing a bar behind now. Uh, the trials and all kinds of punishment is going on. And now, so far, there's no political situation as such. But thing is, the loss is a big loss, and that has never been reprimanded yet. And people, those who suffer, they're still kind of suffering because there's nobody to care, take care of them. Churches were shut down. For so many years, at least three to four years, the church bell uh, never rang. No Christmas, no Easter, no joy of being a Christian, except for these Christians that they were carrying the wounds of Christ for their sake, for Christ's sake. And so now, uh, we are taking a group this year, uh, but Two Rivers has been a big part of it. We've been watching your ministry, all of you, uh, supportive of Pastor Will, his wife, his wonderful family, such a dedicated family, we see their sacrifices. And we thought maybe we should try to plug in here. And here the opportunity comes. So next month, God willing, we are planning to go as a group and we are going to minister to these people. We want to console them. Many of them have never seen a white person. They want to be touched. They want to be hugged, maybe kissed. Uh, we want to give them food for a couple of days. We want to invite them to a spot on our campus. We want to teach them, preach them. As such, they are the faith warrior. You know, Their faith level is so much higher than us. I don't think we are going to increase their faith level, practically. But thing is, we want to rejoice together. And we want to share something that God has blessed us here in America. Five dollar, ten cents. Uh, we've been thinking about all of you for today. Yesterday, you all have been prayed for. That's why you are here today. <laughs> it's a great opportunity, dear friends. Because this, your offering, your support, is going to sponsor one of those uh, uh, faith warriors. They will have... Uh, we'll be traveling to th three or four different locations. One of those locations are uh, situated on the uh, very, very higher mountain up. There are people half naked still. We want to share them the love of Christ. We will be inviting a lot of pastors, elders. We'll be teaching them. Now for gathering all these people, we have a little bit of expenses. And we as body of Christ, we want to share something. Your sacrificial giving will change and impact this brother's and sister's life forever. That's right. So, so yeah, you can hold on to that. So what, what we have together today, this morning, is this opportunity to, as a body of believers, if you look at your, your sheet that you were passed out, it's is titled the India Challenge. And in this challenge, it basically runs down to a couple of real simple things. Um, every two-thirds of all Americans that are employed will spend an average of $11.20 a day on coffee and lunch. So $11.20 a day is being spent on coffee and lunch, and it costs $5.10 to sponsor one of these pastors, one of these people who are suffering in India to be able to come to this conference that we're going to hold, and we're going to Morning, noon, and night, we're going to be able to encourage them. We're, that's going to, that $5.10 is going to cover their travel cost, and it's going to cover 11 meals and their housing in order for us to be able to encourage them. And then in the evenings, what's going to happen, we're going to have this huge group of believers together, and we're going to have a Jesus festival. 
And in the evening, we're going to invite the, the people from the surrounding areas to come. And we're going to declare that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that he is the way to God. And then when we do that, we believe that there are going to be a whole bunch of people who are going to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then there's going to be uh, evidence of that through miracles, through healings. And we're going to see God work in people's lives the way the Bible says it will happen. And so the challenge to everyone here is that we would look at and begin to consider that I would commit each meal, if, you're, if you would take and say, all right, instead of coffee today and lunch today, I'm going to go ahead and use that money. I'm going to eat rice and drink tea. That's what we're going to be eating while we're there. We're going to be living very humbly. And we're going to drink tea and eat rice. And instead, while we're here, we're just going to give up a little bit of our comfort. And so the challenge for us is to have a little bit of momentary discomfort to make a monumental impact. So the way, go ahead, Sama, you, you want to go ahead and share with us. Um, thank you. Um, praise the Lord. Uh, when, while we are watching that video about India, like a persecution, and that the language you heard, that is a language we spoke, and uh, that happened in our area when we belong, and our hometowns, and um, we, I just... I just feel so sad when I saw that 2008, and um, I took my girls, uh, Shelly, Hosanna, me. We are in India that time, and uh, my, and uh, we didn't know this happened. And people talking about, and somebody came and told us we are in an orphanage. Saima, you should leave America soon, and uh, why, what happened, something gonna going, something happen, and you can't even drive, because they gonna block all roads, and uh, and they gonna shut down all buses, you can't go airport, and uh, suddenly, in within, like, uh, one day, they took my brother to jail, and uh, something happened, and they, they trying to everywhere, the situation very bad, we didn't understand. And uh, before we come, we want to go to village, uh, visit Hemant's village. It is um, like uh, 10 hours away from the orphanage. And uh, then while we are in the, his house, and uh, the, we heard that they blocked the road, and only one road, there is uh, no other way we could come to orphanage and get our passport because our passports are in orphanage in building. Then so somebody told us, you don't travel to Nanda um, unless we tell you. Then after, the, after that, uh, they, they took up the block. We came in night to Nanda, and we came to Bhubaneshwar. And um, after a while, we heard that they uh, they burned our house where we, where I born, and, the, and my pe my mother was old, and my nephew nieces uh, they run away in midnight in jungle, and all that happened in India 2007 and 2008, where we uh, live, where we started our life and our mission and ministry. But now, Lord brought us in beautiful country where we can have all our joy and peace and we introduce our life and our mission here and you heard about our testimony and the great blessings from you. We are want to take India and we really appreciate and give you thank you that you are concerning about us and you care about us and you love us and you bringing a powerful mission and peace and kingdom to India, and thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's give it up for Hemant and Saima. Thank you guys for sharing the story. You know, as, as I was this week preparing for this day, the, I began to think about the story of what's happening there in India, and I began to think about one of the stories that I see in the Bible it's where a teacher of the law comes to Jesus, and he says, Teacher, what, what must I do to receive eternal life? What do, what do I need to do? And Jesus turns and looks at the teacher of the law, and he says, 
well, how do you see it? What do you read in the scriptures? And the teacher of the law said to Jesus, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looks at him and he says, well, you've read well. That's the answer. In the teacher of the law, then, the Bible says he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, then, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus turns to him, and he tells him this story. He says, there was a man who was on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he walked on his trip. He was attacked by a band of thieves. And they beat him, and they robbed him, and left him in the gutter on the side of the street. Well, a priest was coming down the road, and he passed by him on the other side. Likewise, in a few moments, a Levite came by and passed by him on the other side of the road. But then a Samaritan came. He went to where he was. He bound up his wounds. He poured oil on them, and then He put the man on his donkey and took him to an inn and told the innkeeper, here's some money, take care of him until I can return. And so Jesus turned to the teacher of the law and he said, which of those three was a neighbor to that man? And the teacher of the law said, well, the Samaritan was. And Jesus said, well, then go and do likewise. And so I think for us as believers, we all understand, like the teacher of the law, that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. That part we have, the understanding. But I believe that God wants us to go beyond the understanding into the place that Jesus talks about, where he says, who is our neighbor? And Jesus basically says, Find the person that's hurting. Find the one that is suffering. Find the one that on your path when you are walking in in about your day, there's someone there who is hurting. Well, that's what we have come into this opportunity together as a body here at Two Rivers. We have been in relationship with Hemont and Saima, and we have heard about this particular reason. And I don't know how God orchestrates what God orchestrates, but he has orchestrated this relationship. And here we are, a group of people that have access to resources and means and potential. And what I want you to do is I want us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And then I want us to love our neighbor as ourself. And I want us to begin to connect and begin to think about what does it mean to love our neighbor as ourself And I think the word I want us to begin to zero in on is this word, love. I think that we can be motivated by all kinds of things, like guilt, shame, and things that will not last. But the kingdom of God runs on love. And so for us, as believers, when we look around, we could hear in that story what we have to do. What has to be done? But I believe that love moves us out of the place of safety into a place where we're willing to embrace discomfort. See, if I were to say to you today, you ought to embrace discomfort, you would look at me and say, oh my goodness, Pastor Will, what are you talking about? Why should I do that? Well, there's lots of good reasons to embrace discomfort. Number one, no pain, no gain right? If you go into the gym and you work out, you, I, I like to say last set, best set. Why? Because it's the last set and I want to crank that thing and I'm working hard. If you go into the gym with me, I'll lift you under the, I'll lift you under the weights. Oh, and then I'll go home and I'll be sore. Why? Because that pain leads to something beneficial in my life. But, but I do that for the end result, for the end gain. And there is something about discomfort in our life. If we avoid discomfort, we will never get to a place where we can grow. Growth is a product of discomfort. We don't go through difficulties. We don't go through trials to just go through them as believers. 
The Bible basically says that trials are put in place for us to grow. So as believers, when we go through discomfort, we are to grow through discomfort. Everybody say, grow through it. Well, there are times in our life when if we are willing to embrace discomfort, it means that we are willing to go out of our way to love. And love is what gives us the ability to embrace discomfort. Discomfort will take us where we didn't think, or love will take us where we didn't think we would ever go. That's why when the Good Samaritan sees the man on the side of the road, something really cool takes place. Sometimes you have to trade places with someone who is hurting. That's what love causes us to do. Go ahead and look at Luke chapter 10. And it says in verse 34, He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. I love it that the Good Samaritan trades places with the man who is hurting. We don't know his backstory. We don't know what all is going on in his life, but we know what a good neighbor does. And that's the picture that Jesus has given us to live our lives. So as we come to this moment, I, I want us to come to this moment with this idea that if I'm going to follow Jesus, I need to be motivated by love. But love doesn't just feel good all the time. Love doesn't just dance and skip. How many are in committed, loving relationships and know love doesn't always feel so good? <laughs> love hurts. I'm about to sing a song. <laughs> love, love stinks. I don't know the rest of the words, uh, and, and I would butcher that, but that's the idea that love Sometimes there's some conflict involved in our relationships. But because there's conflict, it doesn't mean that, oh, well, I guess it wasn't meant to be. I guess that's the end. No, that's not what love says. Love says, and this is the picture that love is for us as believers, in that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Love says it it's not dependent on that person's response. It's dependent on mine. I control my heart. I know how to make decisions to advance love. And I'm going to discipline my heart to give this other person what they deserve. Oh, I shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> well, I'm going to give this person love that they don't deserve. How's that? That's a little better, right? Because that's the way Jesus loved us. He gave us love that we don't deserve. And so if, if we are going to love that way, we have to embrace discomfort. There's some things in our life that are going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to get up in the morning and serve at Two Rivers Assembly every single week. But we do it because we love people. We do it because we've decided that God loved me, and I'm going to respond to that love in worship, and I'm going to give my utmost for his highest. Giving your best isn't always easy, but it's the right thing when we're motivated by love. And so today we come to this moment where we have this opportunity. There's a whole bunch of people. There's, we want to sponsor 2,000 people that are persecuted, 2,000 pastors, 2,000 believers who have gone through a tremendous time of trial. But we have this moment where we're going to go over and we're going to have these, this conference where they're going to come together, they're going to be encouraged, they're going to rejoice, we're going to sing together. And really for the first time since the persecution have open air gospel declaration meetings where people are going to come to know Jesus and the church is going to be set back on fire and know that they can go and be the good Samaritan to everyone there in India, the people that hurt them, they're going to be able to bless. And so that's what we're going to go to do. We're going to go lift up the name of Jesus Christ to our brothers and sisters who are hurting in another part of the world. And so that's going to cost us. 
that's going to mean that we have to embrace a little bit of discomfort for a, por- for a portion of time. And with that, it may not at first sound all that exciting, but I want to tell you something. When you begin to embrace discomfort, when you, there's good things that happen in our life. When I go to the gym and I begin to work out, at first it hurts, but you know what? Later on, look at this. Look at this specimen, right? So, so there's good things that happen, y'all. And, and that's, that's what happens when we go ahead and we say, you know what? I'm going to move past my discomfort. I'm going to go, I'm going to take, I don't have to. I could be like the priest. I could be the Levite. I could walk on by. In fact, that could be a big inconvenience to their day. And we don't know what the good Samaritan was up to. He might have had a really important meeting that he was headed to. But he was willing to get off of his donkey, in another way of saying it, in the King James Version. He was willing to get off of his donkey. If you don't know the King James Version, go look it up and you'll know what I'm talking about. And he was able to change somebody's life. And that's what it's all about. So today, as you begin to to think about a momentary discomfort in my life, you know, I I don't want us to just give out of the overflow. When you look at your budget and you're you're probably sitting and saying, well, here, how much do I have available? I don't have anything available. I guess I can't help. Well, you know, we we didn't even move into discomfort in that moment. We just looked at our budget and said, well, do I have any extra money? I guess not. Well, that's not what discomfort looks like. That's not what Jesus is talking about here in this parable. What Jesus is talking about is being uncomfortable, going out of our way for somebody who's hurting. And so what I want us to think about, what I want us to begin to process is, What does that look like for me? In our culture, we are so caught up in the American dream. How much can I lay up in store for my future? Is this going to derail me from my plans for today? Is this going to mess up what things look like for my budget and how I want to function and how I want to operate? Isn't that how we think? But today we have, if we're going to embrace discomfort, That discomfort that we can embrace through the India challenge is simply to take a meal and say, I'm going to eat rice today for lunch. It's what they eat every single day. They're they're not in a place in the world where they can go to McDonald's and pick out a a 99-cent cheeseburger. We're going to feed them 11 times, these pastors, 11 meals, and provide their cost of travel for $5.10. It's amazing the transformation and the impact that $5.10 can make on one person's life when it's nothing to us. It's nothing. $5.10. I spend that, I spend twice that every time I go to eat for myself. And so what I'm asking is that we would consider embracing discomfort. Because at some point, it has to be more than just well, I guess I can fit that into my schedule. I I wasn't planning on this happening today, Pastor. I wasn't planning on coming to church and having you talk about this because I didn't budget it in my budget early on. That's not what happened for the Good Samaritan. He went out of his way. He embraced discomfort, and it changed something in someone's life. We don't know the rest of the story for the man who was hurt, but we know the story for what happened in the Good Samaritan, Jesus gave honor to him above the priest and above the Levite. And and that is the picture of how we are to love. And so today, would you embrace the India challenge? Would you be willing to give uncomfortably? Some of you will go ahead and say, I'll do all 11 meals. I'm gonna do it, 11 meals. Every time I do that, I'm gonna text $10.20 $10.20 in and just be done with it. Or some of you are planners and you'll, you'll 
give up that and eat that rice and drink that tea. And in the end, you'll write a check or you'll bring cash or whatever that looks like for you. People give in lots of different ways. I know I need to give right away. I need to get out my phone and give it right away or I'll try to spend it on something else. And in that, I think some of us have the ability to go far beyond the $110 or $120 that this would raise over the span of the next six weeks. Some of us could right now sit down and write a check for $1,000 and it wouldn't hurt. Or $500 and it wouldn't hurt. And what I'm challenging us to do is to go into a place that it actually becomes uncomfortable. Because we have 2,000 people who have suffered for Jesus, who have a moment in their life that's going to be radically impactful. And we don't know how many churches are going to be planted out of this conference. We don't know how many lives are going to be changed. We don't know how many salvations are going to occur. We don't know how many miracles are going to occur. But I do know how many that won't if we don't. And so today, could we just just bow our heads and close our eyes? If I could have the band come up, the rest of the band, and bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want you to begin to think about what that looks like to embrace discomfort. I want you to begin to think about what it looks like to go beyond what my budget says so that my momentary discomfort could make a monumental impact. That's what love looks like. We all have this opportunity to love, and we have all have this opportunity to get off our donkey and do something. Right? Get off our, get out of the normal routine and make an impact. And so let's pray. Lord, in this next couple of moments, I ask that you would speak to us. And your words are so powerful. Your words are so good because when you speak to us, You fill us with love. We don't have to generate love. We don't have to do any of that. And God, I just pray that in this moment, as we come before you, that you would deposit love in us. You've already done it. We know that. But some of us need to be awakened to it. Some of us need to be alive to it. God, we can't do this in the natural. We need your supernatural love to fill us. Some of us are going to decide to give because we know in faith that you're going to begin to open doors in our life because we're going to stop seeking our kingdom first. We're going to start seeking your kingdom first so that we can be broken of our selfishness, broken of living to our own way. God, this isn't going to benefit us. It's going to benefit somebody else. And some of us need that so desperately in our lives to stop living for me and to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray it, amen.